Hey everyone, welcome to Neighbor Science, the only podcast about political economy and anime. I'm Ryan Salisbury. I'm Chris Nivens. I was thinking today, like, I mean, like, most podcasts open that way. They're like, welcome mm-hmm. to, and then the show mm-hmm. name, and it's like, that doesn't actually really make any sense. You're not, like, arriving anywhere. Right. <laughs> like, welcome to... If, if we were running a hotel called Neighbor Science, then mm-hmm. that would make sense, mm-hmm. but... Mm-hmm. Or well, you you know you can say like welcome to the greatest show on earth. I'm but you, the, PT but you say Barnum. That at a circus, you're right, like at a place. Right. <laughs> yeah, like um, what are, what are like all the talk show people say? Don't they just say like good evening, folks? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Like Chapo does, like oh, it's your Chapo for the week. That makes right, sense. right, sort of. But like even like uh, like block party, they're like welcome uh, friends and idiots and friends who are also idiots. <laughs> <laughs> it's block party. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't invent the convention. Yeah, um, we didn't it. start like fire. sheep. Yeah, like sheep. Exactly. <laughs> Sheeple. I mean, it's sheep me because I'm the one who's been saying it the whole time. Yeah, it was like yeah. I think it was just like that was literally the first thing that I could think of to say to open the show, and I was just like, well, mm. I guess I, that's how I open it. Yeah, here it goes. <laughs> you know, it's like welcome to neighbor science. We are neighbor science. Mm-hmm. We also have individual names. They're not very good, but that's what we have, you know. Uh, <laughs> My name's really pretty pretty bad, I think. Yeah. Salisbury. Yeah. It's like yeah. the most obvious insult ever for my name. Oh, like the steak. <laughs> 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 now all the listeners are gonna be like <laughs> replying to the account. <laughs> like, oh, so like the steak, huh? <laughs> right. You like that? <laughs> steak berry. More like dingleberry steak. <laughs> I don't know. The only like original one I ever got was like strawberry. I'm like, well, at least you you know made some effort, right? <laughs> yeah, with me it was like what? To be like, oh, uh, Christopher. <laughs> and I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck are you on about? Like now that now Nivens they would go oh, like for doing romance. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like yeah. <laughs> they'd be like, you know. N- nibbles i'd be like i don't give a fuck about what the fuck you're just trying to yeah i'm gonna nibble on your mom's pussy too <laughs> right, right. <laughs> nibble on your dad's pussy even <laughs> exactly um so anyway <laughs> uh today we uh we're actually doing another political economy and anime episode mm-hmm. so it's not uh, about fucking your dad it's yeah, about I'm, your- I'm trying to make more of an effort to bring more anime into it so today we're talking about cargill uh which is the largest privately owned company in the u.s mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. revenue um and uh, code code gas cord code cord gas code gay ass <laughs> code gay ass. Speaking of your dad, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Cargill Cargill first, and then uh, code gay ass later. Um. So yeah, Cargill most uh the largest company privately owned in the, the US most and the largest, huh? The most and the largest. Yeah, the most and yes. the largest. And uh, among all corporations, it's actually larger than AT and T. So it's very very big. Um. We also mentioned it on the Venezuelan episode. It's the largest company in Venezuela, which is interesting. I will talk about later. Yeah. Um, so, its main trade um, for like you know most of its life was uh, grain exports and grain storage and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Basically, like a farming services company, right? And, and a like a food service company as well. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So it has a de facto monopoly in the U.S. on a specific type of salt called uh, Leslie salt. Mm. Um, which is like the main type of salt used in fast food and other restaurants because okay. it's like uh, it has like a really high sodium content and it's very like very dense, I guess. Oh, so it's so like it's, yeah, it's good for like shipping yes. purposes. Because right. actually, uh, I think they make it in Venezuela mm-hmm. or in South America at least. Because yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like in Venezuela, yeah, it has, they everything. built like this huge solar evaporation facility to right. make leslie salt ah um this is actually interesting uh because the high sodium content of leslie salt resulting in its like higher um value mm-hmm. i guess for certain purposes it's just uh one case in uh like an ec- like an economic principle i guess you could call it yeah. called the iron law of prohibition okay um but it's really just about um the logistics of shipping and distribution right and and so the iron law of prohibition Mm -hmm. is that um if you outlaw something Uh um then it will still continue to be shipped and distributed and sold but it'll increase in its intensity and in the um uh like the density or the power of the product okay so like if you outlaw like for example 
uh, alcohol, alcohol. <laughs> yeah, yeah then <laughs> then suddenly um people will be like beer is fine but liquor is quicker you know wine is fine but liquor is quicker right and so they'll instead of shipping casks and kegs and cases of beer which is uh-huh. like yeah you know it's got a, like a little buzz to it they'll be doing it with liquor because you're like you can turn liquor into all sorts of shit right right and it's already like the you know it's, it's so it's dense dense and powerful yeah. right and so um, the same principle applies to legal things, uh, but just for these cases of like, well, we need, we would like to be able to have, you know, do more with less, basically. Right. And that's what it boils down to. <laughs> yeah. Another thing about the salt. I mean, I could talk forever about salt personally, but. You right. Know, you're a salt fiend. Try not to get going too much. Um, you know, like having this specific type of salt, it's like 99.6% sodium or some shit like that. God Which damn. is like that's great for like a bureaucratic management type of situation, right? You know, you know, it, it basically like shows the connection between like capitalism and the state because mm-hmm. you know they are they are reducing the qualities of something that they're managing to the sodium content and like the like how expensive it is to transport it yep. and store it. Yep. When like something like you know kosher salt or iodized salt mm-hmm. would be healthier, right? Uh, but they don't use that because <clears throat> money. Exactly, exactly. It kind of reminds me of um, I was like moaning about um on on Twitter a little while ago, the the tendency in like the states for a lot of like these hot sauces that are like American made to like just Texas be Pete. yeah like to just be <laughs> like all about like. Um, like chemical heat and not flavor. Oh, like the Scovilles. Yeah, yeah like yeah. they're all just trying to like outcompete each other and be like, "We're the manliest motherfucking hot sauce you've ever seen," you know. And you're yeah. like, "I don't, I don't like your sauce though." And it's not because I'm like, "Oh, I'm this is a good cry. hot sauce to yeah. put on a gun." Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. And then suck it. And then yeah, um, you know. So you yeah, know, I mean, that's what the market does. I think the <laughs> the hottest pepper has been like uh like they've raised the bar on the hottest mm-hmm. pepper in the world like multiple times in the last like 10 years alone yeah like like three new ones have come out because it used to be like the butch scorpion was like the hottest pepper or something like that yeah or whatever the one is from jamaica oh and yeah then, and then they've they've come out with like two or three other ones that are even mm-hmm. hotter than that mm-hmm. and it's like man why don't you all just get like some fucking pepper spray and like spray right. that shit on your food like right why why does that have to be that spicy i don't care yeah and well and it's like again it's it's just two white guys talking about so it. food's too <laughs> spicy <laughs> <laughs> well again i have a legitimate grievance because i come from a place where like you know there are there are a lot of people in Indonesia, for example, who they don't they don't feel that they've had a meal until they've like sweated and like their eyes have watered. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. So they're like they're not satisfied. They don't feel like full and happy until like it has affected them physically. Yeah. You know, like they've involuntarily shed water. I mean, it is kind of nice. Like, my problem is like I I used to be able to eat spicier foods. I feel like, and now. Mm-hmm. My spice tolerance has gone down just enough where, like, I don't experience that. I experience hotness in my mouth, but I never, like, sweat because of it. Right, yeah. Which, like, that is enjoyable, actually, Mm -hmm. sweating from your food. It's kind of nice. Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. I mean, Um, I just, like, I enjoy sweating in general. Like, I like a nice hot summer day. Mm -hmm. Walk around and sweat. It feels like you you purged yourself. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like a way for us to atone for our sins without actually changing our behavior yeah <laughs> um but now like yeah. even leslie salt is too spicy for me so. <laughs> yeah it's so much sodium in one place yeah i had some leslie salt on the way over here actually i'm in mcdonald's fries that's why you're jittering and scratching your neck yeah, yeah. um yeah so uh that's that's my opinion about salt i guess i guess we just covered salt <laughs> Um, so, all right, let's talk about the history of, uh, Cargill. Mm-hmm. So it's actually a very old company. It was founded in 1865. So it's just as old as like the freedom of black people in America. Yes. Basically. Yeah. Only two years younger. Wow. Yeah. Um, by, uh, so it was founded by William W. Cargill, who was the son of a sea captain. That's, that sounds really cool. That sounds like a cool thing to say. Like, right. oh yeah, I'm a, I'm the son of a sea captain. Right. Like, damn dude. Fuck, you know, like practically royalty on the seas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it turns out like he's like, but I hate the ocean, and my dad beat me. <laughs> like, okay, okay. It'd be funny oh. if he's a captain of like a dinghy. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's like one other guy in the boat. He's just like, I'm the sea captain. It's like, <laughs> you, do you just tell me what to do? Like, actually, really sucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Should pull your weight, man. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, uh, so William W., uh, he bought a grain storage building in Conover, Iowa, um, presumably with his dad's money. Right. A um, little landscaping, a little photography, a little sea captainry. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so he actually, he had a bunch of brothers as well, mm-hmm. typical of pre, uh, I guess, 1960s families. Hmm. Um, excuse me. Um, so the brother later joined the company, and uh, together they built more grain storage buildings and started a lumber yard. So really exciting yeah. stuff <laughs> yeah. so far. Um, Ripping. Yeah, and then later another brother joined. So many fucking brothers. <laughs> and uh, th- then they started to expand the operation like nationally. So they uh, went outside the state and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I have a quote from Forbes about this. Mm-hmm. Um, they say, uh, well... I didn't really start at a good spot, did I? Just <laughs> talking about suspicions. <laughs> suspicions. Um, so it says Cargill uh, goes to uh, great lengths to keep its profile low. Uh, some foreign outposts bear no company shingle, so like, mm-hmm. like they don't no have signage, any logos anywhere. No, yeah, yeah. Um, its annual report contains no financial tables. Uh, discretion is so deeply woven into the company that even former Cargillites shy away from public comments about their old employer, compliments included. Jesus, what the fuck? Uh, Cargill has been incomparably adept at growing without having to go public and making all the compromises that would entail. So, like, human sacrifice yeah. is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Everyone has to eat the former Making CEO. all the sacrifices <laughs> that would entail. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, one thing that's kind of interesting about Cargill is, you know... It's a family-owned company mm-hmm. um, because it's private. I don't. I don't think they really sell shares at all. I mean, I'm sure they have them, but um, you know, private companies they can just sell shares at their discretion. They can like sell it for whatever they want. Basically, mm. they don't have a, a valuation like a publicly traded company does, uh, because the, the the valuation for a public company is basically like what the market judges its share price to be times the number of outstanding shares. Um. So there's a split between two lineages in the family, the Cargills and the McMillans. So when William W. died, uh, his fail son, Will, I'm assuming Will Jr., uh, tried to make a bunch of speculative land deals in Montana, uh, which left the company with a bunch of financial problems. Um, <clears throat> so Will's brother-in-law, uh, John McMillan, uh, took over the company and issued equity-backed securities to pay its debts. So it said, like, I didn't really understand what they actually issued. It said gold certificates. But then when I went to look that up, that just meant money in the day. So it's like, <laughs> right. so they issued money? Yeah. I don't think that's Interesting. right. So I'm, I'm thinking it was probably, like, corporate bonds or something like that. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know how far back corporate bonds go, but I don't think um, 1900 would be too far back for those to exist. Uh, hmm. but I don't know. Hmm. I, hmm. I, I, I was trying to like get a, an overview of everything and didn't have time to like go into a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the show maybe is better when we do it like bi-weekly instead of weekly, but could I be just like we releasing weekly it just feels better. It's your show. Know. Well, yeah. I don't know about that. I think it's publicly owned. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> So uh, in 1909, uh, John McMillan was made manager and uh, dominant owner of Cargill. And today his descendants still own like way more of the company than the Cargill lineage. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So even though it bears their name, right. I think they own like like 15% of the company and the McMillans own mm. like, you know, uh, like 60% or something like that. Mm. Wow. So they have, a, they have a few other uh, owners or shareholders. I'm not sure which one it is. Um. So in uh, 1934, uh, John gave control of the company to his son, John Jr., so another fail son here, mm-hmm. uh, who was a World War I artillery officer. And uh, I asked Soy Boy, who is uh, former military, mm-hmm. uh, whether this would have been like a, a like a bougie position. And he said uh, most likely it was like a position for engineers or rich kids. Yep. So makes sense. Yep. Uh, during the Dust Bowl, <clears throat> he grew the company so aggressively that the... Chicago Board of Trade, not exactly sure what that is. Do you know? Well, it's uh, it's probably in Chicago. I don't know about that. I don't think we can assume that. Shit. Well, could be in California. Then there's n- no way that we can know what okay. this is. Well, that's fine. Um, 
So anyway, uh, they accused him of trying to monopolize the grain market, and so he was banned from futures trading in 1938. Which is hilarious, yeah. because... <laughs> <laughs> because it means they they basically saved his ass from going completely under in the fucking depression. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, like the other thing is like uh, I think futures are very important for grain sales or like well, agricultural that's commodity yes, trading, that is trading in general. True. Because like yeah. um, so like the academic economist take on futures mm-hmm. is uh oh futures are to uh. You know, avoid future price risk so that if the price declines, then you can sell it at a guaranteed price in the future. Right. But as as we talked about on one of our episodes, I don't remember which one, um, people actually just use it for speculative investment like yeah. 90% of the time. Yep. Something like that. Yep, so. Exactly. And, it's the, and the gambling that comes from that, the speculation that comes from that uh, and that it's mostly involved in is what causes these crashes right. such as the depression where – Something that was theoretically supposed to work, you know, which is like the, you know, people work, they get money, they use yeah. the money to pay for goods, blah, 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 and then you die. And like, in this case, as in the recession and everything, you know, yep. it's just people gambling on that shit and the futures yeah. crash because the trust crashes and so everybody runs in the bank in, what, in this case or like the real estate crashes in our more recent case. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, this is one thing where like, if you had to be like registered as like a company mm-hmm. that uses grain mm-hmm. in its operations or yeah. something like that and you were like you know classified as like an agricultural or food service company right then futures trading would probably work out fine yeah yeah um you know, it's if you're like, a, like an oil processing company, yeah. then oil futures would probably work out fine. But it's, it's, it's like tied public, to your anyone can do it. So it's production. Like, oh, yeah. I have a bunch of money. Mm-hmm. I can bet on the price going up in the future. Yep. Or going down. I don't remember mm-hmm. which one it is. <laughs> yeah, right. That's my problem with all this stuff. I like learn. <laughs> it's lots what, of. I learn about down, a security, and then I'm like, well, yeah. uh, it's one way or the other. Yeah. The two two opposite choices. One of those two. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. The company did very well in World War II, uh, getting lots of business handling grain and building ships for the U.S. Navy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as I could tell, they did not um, profit off of the Nazis like many other American businesses right. did at the time. Yeah. So that's good, I businesses guess. Businesses which continue to do very extremely well, like yeah. the Koch brothers. I mean, they're still supplying the American army, which not much better, really. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, they, they did help defeat the Nazis, and now Germans aren't racist anymore, so... Oh, thank God. All worth it. I mean... Same with Italians. Not racist. Yeah. Like, what a relief that we, like, you know, purged those areas of the earth from from such horrible prejudices. Yeah. Good thing we got rid of phalangism forever. Yeah. And that it'll (laughs) never come back again. (laughs) Um, So the next executive, uh, Erwin Kelm. Which is a fantastic name. It's a great name. Uh, He was appointed in 1960, and he was the first outside of either of the royal bloodlines mm-hmm. to uh, be a manager, like an executive manager of the company. Mm-hmm. So he um, was really just countercultural, you know? Yeah. What a hippie. Yeah, and he seems like a business nerd, so he pushed yep. the company to become more technical, right. uh, getting involved in processing grain rather than just handling it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, during his regime, they were also early adopters of telex machines, mm-hmm. which uh, I think that's basically That's like, for porn, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's like a, it's basically like a phone system. It's a phone-based system, and it has like a screen on it. Ah. Uh, so it's basically like it's sort of like email or text messages, but uh, okay, it operates through the phone, and it was available in the 1960s. Okay, the Telex network was a public switched network of teleprinters, similar to a telephone network for the purpose of sending text-based messages. Oh, okay, so it's like Amazing. a fax, basically. Yeah, like a fax. Yeah. Okay. Um, cause I know like, and it basically was replaced by the fax machine. It was okay. like, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's still, you can still run telex machines. Cause, mm-hmm. um, I worked on this, uh, this is going to sound so terrible. I worked on an app development thing. I worked cool. on an app. Cool. Um, and, uh, it has all these, like, it's like for like, it's like a liberal thing basically. Okay. It has all these resources for rape victims and a okay. bunch of them have TTY numbers, which I think are telex machines. Okay. And it's basically okay. for like disabled people to use okay so well you know that's a long story to say like i've seen telex numbers before <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i helped libs pretend to solve a problem <laughs> i mean i'm sure they're helping sort of 
you know. I mean, I fucking hope so. I'm not, like, not proud of the app or anything like that, you know. So you're proud of the app? I wouldn't say I'm proud of it. I'm not <laughs> not proud of it. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. Like I am the other ones that I work on. It's pretty high bar. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's probably the the one of the, relatively the best thing that I've done at that job. Gotcha. I guess. Nice. But I think we only have like like a dozen downloads. So I don't know. Well, Whatever. I'm not the marketing team. So <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, they used uh, Telex machines to relay changes that affect grain yields. Okay. So, like, if, yep. if there was, like, some weather event or something like that, they would, like, dial the manager and be mm-hmm. like, oh, mm-hmm. there's give me a, oh, my God. a monsoon! <laughs> right, right. And then they'd be like, oh, uh, raise the price uh, one cent per per bushel. Right. And then everybody like, lost clack. their mind in New yep. York yep. somehow. Yep. Um, <laughs> in the 70s, I like, uh, God, I tried to look for more information on this, but I just couldn't figure it out because it, it's just, like, too much shit. Okay. And not enough time. So mm-hmm. in the seventies, the USSR began importing grain in large amounts, mm-hmm. and somehow Cargill profited from this. So I don't know if they were like exporting grain to the USSR, um, but I did find out that around the time, like there was like a US ban on exports to the USSR. So I'm not really sure how that worked. Okay. I'm guessing maybe they were multinational by then, and they were like oh, just circumventing the export ban by like Could oh be. we yeah. ship it to argentina and then from argentina to the soviet union or something like that okay i just i just googled um 1970s grain ussr and the first thing that came up was a wikipedia article titled the great grain robbery which is the july 1972 purchase of 10 million tons of united states grain mainly wheat and corn by the soviet union at subsidized prices uh-huh. which resulted in higher grain prices in the united states so that's one way that like a say like a capitalism owned again exactly <laughs> just like boom boom, boom. <laughs> um but also how like a massive conglomerate type of thing can like game the system because yeah. they're like oh we sold it and we get higher grain prices <laughs> <laughs> um, because of the market yeah it's just math it's just math look at the graph 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 so they call it a robbery because they bought it at subsidized prices i guess uh it says grain prices soon reached 125 year highs in chicago okay in a 10 month span soybeans went from 331 to 1290 a bushel that's three dollars 31 and 12 dollars okay but have you seen chicago murder rates I mean, yeah, all of it's murder. <laughs> Food prices around the world rose 50% in 1973. Nice. Um, yeah, the U.S. government spent $300 million. I like that because it's good for business. Yeah. <laughs> right. I like when prices go up on Hell the yeah. It's good. Um, and basically, yeah, the U.S. sort of like subsidized these purchases whatever and yeah. man if only we had matt Brink's social wealth fund and a bunch of uh <laughs> you know grain commodity securities uh-huh. Uh-huh. or something like that yeah then we could have really done ubi mm-hmm. without causing inflation exactly even though even though that was inflation but th- yeah never mind yeah no inflation's when when do- when one dollar becomes worth 90 cents yes so, exactly as we all know yes <laughs> universal basic grain <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know you don't have to look it up do you know off the top of your head who was head of the Soviet Union at the time was it like wasn't it Brezhnev, Brezhnev. in 1973 is that when they inv- is that when the tanks went into Hungary or whatever whatever country that was uh, Ukraine fuck, Poland dude. I don't know how many times have they done that I'm not I'm not like a USSR scholar so oh, okay. I'm, I'm mm. uh, yeah it was Brezhnev okay um and there was like some weird shit with Israel question mark. Somebody who listens who knows the USSR and its history should should just like tell us. Yeah. Phone in also, right why now. Does, why does Hoja look like uh Mr. Rogers? It's a great question. I'm sure for some people he is like Mr. Rogers. What if they actually are the same person? That would be fucking hilarious. He's like <laughs> he's like <laughs> moonlighting as a <laughs> It's an Albanian politician. <laughs> it's like, won't you please? Won't you please? Won't you please build my bunker? <laughs> um. So, uh, 
uh, yeah. So in, in 1976, uh, John Jr.'s nephew, Whitney McMillan, mm-hmm. took over the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, the government tried to come after them for market manipulation. Again. Yeah, but they didn't they didn't do too much damage to the mm. company, so right. they either got off scot free or like, you know, got a slap on the wrist or something like that. Um I think they were doing like price fixing or something like that. Or they were accused of it, which right. means they were doing it. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, that's how that works. Um it's also funny because it's like like price fixing is just when like you do what normal capitalist business does, but you get caught. Yeah. You know? Did you see that story? Um there was a story recently about how um pricing algorithms on amazon uh-huh so like their their prices the prices on amazon are totally computer driven yep um and uh so somebody found out that two competing products mm-hmm. being run by like rationally calculating computer algorithms mm-hmm. can just learn to collude <clears throat> and like raise the price above the like so-called equilibrium level jesus christ um and so like the researchers like did like a test Mm-hmm. run mm-hmm. or maybe maybe i was thinking maybe i'm thinking of uh i was reading a steve keen article about it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh yeah he he wrote this like math something some math uh computer language okay um simulation of like two competing producers mm-hmm. and he basically like was like yeah so uh unlike the neoclassical model where mm-hmm. uh you know competing um producers drive down yeah they drive down prices to the marginal cost because mm-hmm. marginal cost equals marginal profit right it's actually the complete opposite <laughs> Mar- like the uh price that they can most efficiently sell at is a collusion price uh-huh. and they basically right. go far above the so-called equilibrium price because right. uh why would they lower it They're because just, they can yeah it doesn't yeah. make sense yeah um it's pretty interesting um so okay um the last thing about their history, their earlier history, is uh, they have this piece of lore mm-hmm. uh, about a manager named Renee Howergrude. Mm. Uh, so she's currently an upper level manager, yeah. or was whenever this was happening. No, she still is, written. definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ever since 1983. You know yeah. Okay. Yeah. She has West. So, it's very you know, eerie. You probably know all those guys. <laughs> yeah. We're all related. It's, yeah. it's all the same. All we the all McMillans look the same. The yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you go to any bar- uh, birthday parties or anything like that? Uh, at, at the Cargill? Yeah. No, at all. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what? Did you ever go to a birthday party when you were a kid? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks, dude. I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, Renee Howard was working at the Kansas City office. Mm-hmm. Working at the Kansas City in 1983. <laughs> the Kansas City? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, and uh, so she was approached by a co-op with uh, like like a probably a bunch of anarchists or something like that. Right. They had three bargefuls of sunflower seeds, and they they called up the office and uh, nice. asked, like, yeah, uh, who can we sell these to? Uh-huh. You know, like, can we sell these to you? Mm-hmm. And so she asked, like, uh, she's this is a quote from an article. Which I, of course, did not link. Uh, she asks, "Who's who handles Sunnies? Because <laughs> you know they can't just say like sunflower seeds, right?" Um, she asked the trading manager. Nobody came to reply. She was told to quote, "Check it, check out. it out." Good thing they quoted check that. Check it out. Yeah, I would. I would really look down on them if they wrote that yeah. as just a normal thing. In I would have been like, "What is this colloquialism yeah. doing in this extremely serious, paper? very unprofessional article yeah. here?" Wow. Guys. <laughs> Uh, so she signed a contract to buy the seeds and haggled for rail transport and storage at a Houston elevator and lined up customers in Mexico and among bird seed makers. Cargill earned $200,000 in the business that first year. Pocket change. Thus was Cargill's <laughs> sunflower business born and its leader anointed. Anointed. Yeah. This is, that isn't me editorializing. <laughs> That's, yeah. They're actually using medieval language like that. Yeah. Um, so. They're like... How Grud is now the high priestess of Cargill's sunflowers. <laughs> really just helping seeds. me prove my point, you guys. Yeah. Um, so Howard Grud went on to promotions and postings around the world. Wow. Her Excellency Renee Howard Grud. Yeah. Meritocracy works, folks. Yeah. And that's yeah. the end of the show. That's the end. We should just, you know, work harder. Yeah. And, um, and you know, to be just clear, keep an I mean, eye out for those not deals. Not the end of the episode, but the end of Neighbor Science. So we're done. <laughs> right. Bye. No more neighbors. <laughs> just sunflowers. <laughs> um, 
So later there's a major reorganization, after, you know, other than the, the processing one in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this was in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, I guess. Um, so did, is this a quote? I can't tell. I think it is. Yeah, I think it's a quote. It's a, I would not it's a write line-like this. one. Yeah, I would definitely not write this. Mm. As Cargill spread its seedlings around the globe, <laughs> it typically started small and expanded quietly. God, that's a terrible sentence. <laughs> um, after entering Thailand, it moved from selling seeds and then from selling seeds in the 1990s to feed rice chickens. Okay, yeah, to feed rice chickens, rubber smokehouses, and finance. Cool. I love to sell seeds in the 1990s. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I love to sell rubber smokehouses and finance. <laughs> What? You sell finance? I did put the wrong emphasis on that, right? <laughs> rubber smokehouses. Uh, smokehouses. <laughs> smokehouses. Smokehouses that are made of rubber. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's my favorite kind. Houses for rubber smoke. Yeah, that's where a bunch of guys go and they, you know, they smoke get, each other's rubbers. They bring their hookahs like. <laughs> and uh, they sit in a rubber building yeah. and they smoke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. And finance is like a French yeah. word that I've never heard. Yeah. Well, they they do they do finance in the rubber building. Right, right, right. Yeah. right, right okay. Or it's rubber finance. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but building a global presence was costly. The company typically plowed upwards of 80% of earnings back into the business. Cool. Okay. By the early 1990s... Doesn't that sound like money laundering to you? <laughs> it's like stock buybacks, except... Yeah, yeah. Except like, oh, involve... we put it back into the business, and then the money that was in the business turned into bonuses and shit. <laughs> well, and, like, special it, it corporate didn't, events. It didn't, though, because... By the early 1990s, young members of Cargill of the Cargill and Macmillan clans mm-hmm. were growing restless, owning company shares that had no liquid market ah. and mediocre dividends. Okay. Dividends. So, uh, the share value wasn't going up, mm-hmm. even though it they couldn't beat the average. There was no valuation because it's not mm-hmm. publicly traded, mm-hmm. uh, which was why there's no liquid market. Right. And uh, so the stocks weren't paying dividends, so they weren't able to, you know, poor rich boys fuck off to Paris or whatever, right, right. whatever they wanted. So. That's a real shame. That mm-hmm. sucks for them. I really mm-hmm. feel for them. Uh, so Whitney McMillan countered calls for a public offering with an employee stock ownership plan. So I think what that means is uh, the rich kids could sell their stocks to employees. Oh, cool. That's that's my guess. Okay. Um, in 1993, the company reportedly paid $730 million in cash. To 72 Cargills and McMillans. Holy fuck, 72? <laughs> oh this my god, obscene. man. Yeah, this is like a fucking army. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't, and I it couldn't must even, be destroyed. <laughs> I couldn't even name 72 people that I know. Yeah, I right. Think. Jesus Christ, dude. Um, in exchange for 17% of the firm, so they bought back 17% of their shares, mm-hmm. uh, using that stake to begin the employee stock plan. So, yes, mm-hmm. they. Uh, <laughs> They sold their stocks to the back to the company so that they could sell them to employees. Yep. Cool. Cool. Um, Cargill's board was remade to include just six relatives alongside six independents and five managers. Right. Right. So. So they they narrowed the top of the pyramid. Mm-hmm. Um. I see. Yeah. I mean, seventy-two Cargills and McMillans in in what nineteen ninety-three. It like brought to mind so it's probably like <clears throat> two hundred thirty now. Yeah, basically, um, at least the ones they admit exist. You know, yeah. not the like bastard children and stuff. The ones in the mutant ones in basements. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they do work in the grain and chemo- <laughs> agrochemical industry, so like uh, they probably have some mutants in their family. Yeah, exactly. Um, Hopefully, they don't have powers. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> or like, if they do have powers, they use it like in resentment. Of the Cargills, and yeah, the yeah, as opposed to you know directed at the people who yeah. cursed them with yes. their appearance their or whatever. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it reminds me of like the um, all the like ooing and aahing and crowing and and like fawning of uh, all the like finance magazines and like business magazines uh-huh. and stuff. They're like, oh, there's more millionaires now than ever before, and you're like, yeah, I we were gonna say feel it. Mom. Yeah, well, there's that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, but like. You know, they're, they're like, oh, there's more millionaires and billionaires now than ever before, and it's so fucking and amazing. that's good. Right, and that's good. It's amazing <laughs> and good, and, like, we're all so wealthy, and you're like, uh, 
uh no like we the people who actually work like we uh, can feel that yeah that the, the growth of the Pretty number obvious. of millionaires <laughs> is very painful for us yeah, yeah. Um, and and it partly comes through like this clan thing that like where it's like oh we have a rich clan and our business is booming and we manipulate markets and p- fix prices and yeah and now there's 72 of us and you're like well that accounts for a large share of millionaires yeah yeah, I worked in uh, Del Rey in Alexandria around mm-hmm. 2011, mm-hmm. so like within a few years of the recession, mm-hmm. and um, I drove from Springfield, that neighborhood that I was living in with MS-13 in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So uh, I I worked in the, one of the richest neighborhoods on earth, right? <laughs> and uh, came from one of the most fucked up neighborhoods in Northern <laughs> Virginia, and uh, I would always Hell play yeah. a game on the way to work, uh, which was Count the Porsches. Oh yeah, and uh, I I think the average was like twelve to fifteen. Oh fuck! Yeah, on the way. and mo- almost all of them were in Alexandria, like old town yeah. Alexandria. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can really tell how many millionaires there are around here because. Yep. I mean, there's just so it's many just... of those luxury cars. Now they're all Teslas. Now everyone right. has Teslas. Right. Everybody Porsches are kind of out of fashion now. Show their shit off. Although I've seen plenty of like Bentleys and Rolls Royces and all mm. that kind of shit around here. So. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even counting like DC. I'm just talking about Northern Virginia. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean they got all those like defense industry CEOs and exactly, all that shit. and all the like fucking like old assholes who are like, oh, you know, you should really live in Northern Virginia. It's beautiful there, and it's yeah. so much better and safer. That's and... how I would describe Northern Virginia. Yeah. as beautiful, right? Yeah. Right. And you're like, oh, fuck you, actually. Yeah. yeah. I love an endless uh, like sea dragon of cars going across the. Right. the sea of pavement yep. that's everywhere yep it's really cool it's i love it hell. it owns yeah. actually yeah um <laughs> i would say it's gangster <laughs> if i had to um <laughs> all right so in the 2000s uh oh well this is, okay it's a weird heading uh so cargill already the world's dominant grain seller uh mm. bought the number two player mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in uh, 1999 mm-hmm. i don't know who that was because i didn't write it down uh, just doesn't when, matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, just when grain prices were at a 10 year low. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's actually abnormal. Usually, um, usually you would want to buy a company when the price is very high because then you know that they're you know, mm-hmm. a highly capitalized company. But I guess since they're privately owned, uh, they got a bunch of chumps in charge and they're doing it wrong. So. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Oh, and they say in parentheses here, classic Cargill. It bets big when the chips are re- really cheap. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that they acknowledge implicitly there yeah. that like this is an unusual thing yeah. for companies to do. Yeah, to buy things when they're really cheap. Right, which is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, but it's also like I mean, again, mergers and acquisitions. It makes sense in that in that way where it's like what they really want to do is just dominate the market right what they really want to do in this case is they're, they're not looking to make money they're looking to secure a guarantee of, of yeah. either income or of competitiveness in some way a de facto monopoly of less uh, salt yeah exactly yeah um it's why uh can you imagine like fucking just knowing about that without being like a weirdo that has a podcast <laughs> right, right. about it oh it tastes like leslie salt yeah hmm. or like just like uh you know being like Oh yeah, what do you what do you do? Oh, uh, my company has a monopoly on Leslie Salt. <laughs> right. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> yeah, neither has anyone else. Yeah. So. So. Um. Yeah, they probably don't tip either. Like I just can't imagine. <laughs> I cannot imagine the type of people that these guys would be. The Cargills and the McMillans. They're probably super like mummified looking from all the salt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably like fucking Christian psychos. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If I had to guess. I'm the Cargill and the McMillan clan. <laughs> they probably have British accents or something like that. Right, right. Some kind of weird, like, esoteric, like, holdover accent from yeah. back in the day. And fucking, like, uh, Habsburg jaws or something yeah, like right, that. Yeah, right, right, right. Like, their chins are inside their Adam's apples. <laughs> <laughs> They're one of the few families in America that does arranged marriages. <laughs> right, right, to each other. Yeah. Um, last year, which I... I think it was probably like 2001. I think this article was written like 2000. Last year. Oh, oh, in the article, I was like, yeah, yeah, wait, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, this, it's a Forbes article from 2002. <laughs> okay. That's why they actually know economics sure and aren't do. stupid because they yeah. cover finance and business. So, mm-hmm. uh, so in 2001, 
It paid $580 million for the Purina International and Chow brands. Nice. So Cargill, if they haven't divested from it since then, uh, owns Purina, which we all know. Mm -hmm. And love to feed to our dogs. Yes. Uh, It also bought Rocco Enterprises for an undisclosed sum, becoming the nation's second largest turkey processor. Well, shit. Probably behind Purdue, I'm guessing. Uh, Which, by the way, is another family-owned business. Yeah, I've heard that, and I'm not surprised. Yeah. It's the sort of thing. Yeah, I read about it, and basically, like, the reason they became so big is because most farms were, like, um, they would, like, raise livestock, Mm -hmm. but then they would ship the livestock to a processing facility, who Mm -hmm. would be a separate business that would, I'm guessing, slaughter and package them, Mm. and uh, Purdue built all the facilities... So that they could raise livestock, slaughter them, and pack them on site. Right. And and then just ship them directly to grocery stores. And that's mm-hmm. how they became really big. Because they mm-hmm. basically like got you know vertical integration of the market or whatever. Right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> love that private ownership. I love having all these facts in my brain. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah. It makes me feel good and not bad. <laughs> I can really talk to the average normal people. Yeah. <laughs> right. People are like, you know, I, I see this all the time when... Oh, what you have in there, a turkey sandwich? You know who produces the most turkey in the United States? Exactly. Purdue. Exactly. <laughs> you know how they dominated the industry? Let me tell you about it. <laughs> right, right. It's like, it, it reminds me of um, uh, one of my, one of my uh, like, colleagues or classmates from grad school, and she was always like, she was one of these kind of like happy, like uh, stoner, like not quite a flower child, but like still very like mystical and like, yeah. like very smart. She got like, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Right, right, right. And she was like a very, she was like a 4.3 student in fucking grad school. Oh, geez. Yeah, right. I was like, uh, okay. la da Yeah, right. And at the same time, like, just was like always just kind of like chill and like everything's great. I feel like you can't really be a hippie if your GPA is over three. Yeah. I mean, I. I didn't really get it, but like, (laughs) but she, uh, I love, I love crystals and studying. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. You're like, wait, you don't mean crystal. You mean crystals. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but we were talking one day and I was telling her some story about like, cause like, you know, I have this reputation among friends for being like rather bleak about a lot of things. Mm. Um, that's me too. Yeah, exactly. Right. So then like, I was telling her a story about like, Something about like nuclear security in like some naval yard that I was doing a document for. Okay. And I was like, yeah. And then they, you know, the Navy said that uh, they didn't need to bother with seismic proofing the whole damn thing, even though it's like on a fault. And <laughs> of course, <laughs> they're like, they're like, we're just going to cut corners on the cost. Okay. We don't yeah. want to ma- make too much. That's, dinner. that's actually how a deep water horizon happened. Yeah. Yeah. They, they just cut corners and shit. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. So like, you know, whatever. Uh, so one day, like if there's a, if there's an earthquake, especially if there's the big one that's due in the Pacific Northwest, which is like the thousand or 10,000 year earthquake, that's just going to like make the land go a hundred feet in the air and then back down again. Yeah. Like almost literally. Um, then we're going to have a bunch of, um, fucking Marine nukes just like blowing up underwater yeah. or in the docks. And, and she's like, isn't there also that Yellowstone caldera thing? Oh yeah. That's just going to happen as well. Yeah. Like, it'd be great if they both happened at the same time or triggered each other or God, something. we were fucking doomed. We're so fucking doomed. <laughs> and some of the bo- mo- like some of the best parts of the United States are, like, just going to get fucked. Yeah. And, it's going to be uh, like Pompeii. Yeah. But, like, times, like, a million. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, like, I, I told her this whole story and how, like, I had to, like, carry that around with me for the rest of my life, you know, until yeah. it pu- fucking pulls a plug or, you know, blows whatever. And And she looks at me and she's like, now I understand why you are the way you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this isn't the only fucking thing I know, but it's yeah. just one of many fucking horrible things. I'm still I'm still trying to imagine what type of person this is. Like, yeah. Like asking the professor, like, uh, professor, can I, uh, I mean, he's not going to like help me cheat or anything, but right. can I bring my Reiki master into the exam <laughs> right, with me? Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> just need to kind of like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it is it cheating to align my chakras? <laughs> right, right. Um, so anyway, um, early this year, this is back to the Forbes thing. Yeah. Yep, early yep. this year, Cargill overtook ADM, that classic American company that we all know and love, mm-hmm. uh, as the leader in flour milling by merging its business with a rival. In April, Cargill completed the largest acquisition in its history, buying Sarastar or 
Serra Star. Mm. Uh, just to, you know, use a little French there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a French ingredient maker for 1.1 billion. So it makes French ingredients? Yes. For, okay. Yeah. Um, like, so it's like snails. Yeah, snails, mm-hmm. uh, macarons, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that kind of stuff. Mm. You know, the, the two the two classics. The two classics, <laughs> yes, yes. Snails and macarons. <laughs> uh, probably makes a lot of mirepoix, if I had to guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I love I love going to a uh, you know a nice mirepoix farm and seeing the mirepoix f- plants growing out of the ground. <laughs> uh, so the deal made it one of the world's largest producer of vegetable starches. Oh, I was right. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> and increased its scientific staff by half. So I guess they needed scientists for the macarons. Right. Probably. Macaronists. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Macaronologists. Um. Okay. So. In 2002, um, at the end of this article, basically, uh, Cargill and its three rivals controlled 81% of the U.S. beef market with two other competitors. Mm -hmm. Uh, It holds just as high a share of corn exports. Now, through its Ag Horizons program, it seeks to provide farmers with everything from fertilizer to financial services. So I'm guessing they're giving, they're probably the ones that are giving farmers those loans that are like driving them into debt peonage. Oh, yeah. That's very popular with small farmers. Yeah, they love it. Yeah. The payday loan of Getting farming. That. Yep. Yep. Cool. It happens a lot, unfortunately. That's awesome. I'm glad they're doing that. Yeah. Cool. Um, God, you know, we just got to... Ah, uh, things that I can't say on the air. I always... um, <clears throat> I follow Marshall Steinbaum on Twitter. I don't know if you follow him. Econ Marshall. Maybe. Um, he, He's always talking about uh, uh, antitrust stuff. Okay. And, you know, I have, like, the weird take on business and economics, so I'm like... Right. I mean, I... You're like, so? Antitrust, I guess, sure, but, mm. like, you know, M&A drives the market, so... Right, right. That's just... It's just gonna, like, get worse eventually, yeah. you know? Um, or tomorrow. <laughs> and and in some ways, like, in, in some <clears throat> ways, corporations are worse than small businesses, and in some ways, they're better. Like, mm. like for labor compliance... I think corporations are generally better yeah. because you you can easily send inspectors to mm-hmm, mm-hmm, corporations, but mm-hmm. you can't easily send them to like a million small businesses. Right. Right. But on the other hand, it's harder to sue them mm-hmm. because they have bigger, bigger pockets, law, law teams deeper pockets. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think it's very obvious which, which is better, really. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't remember where I was going with that. That's okay. Antitrust and uh, oh yeah, this kind of thing. loans for farmers basically. Yeah, so yeah. controlling eighty one percent of the beef and corn market, uh, and being able to make like farm loans and shit. Yeah, you should have some antitrust stuff there, I guess. Yeah, I think that would be good. Um, Staley, I don't know who the fuck that is. Whatever, Staley, this guy in the article, uh, recounts a lunch with farmers in the Nebraska town of Motala a year ago. When I asked what their biggest concerns were, they said, manage price risk, manage price risk, and manage price risk. (laughs) Uh, Then don't screw me at harvest time by making them wait around to unload. Okay. Yeah, don't do that. That makes them mad. Right. Um, Some farmers, however, fear Cargill itself may become their biggest problem. I don't see how that could be. (laughs) Uh, Cargill, that old... It had this uh, parenthetical thing that was like, oh, here, you can read an explanation of what the fuck we mean by this. And I clicked on it, and it was 404. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, no explanation there, really. You know, that's... But they do have a brief one here. Uh, consolidation is forcing farmers to abandon being entrepreneurs. That classic thing that farmers are. <laughs> right, right. And uh, become low-wage contractees of big corporations. So, yeah, that's... Okay, right. that basically confirms the farm. There we thing. go. So yes, they're being forced into <clears throat> debt peonage by yep. giant, a giant company run by psychotic mm-hmm. Christians. Yep, yep. Cool. I mean, that's that's what uh, that's what happens in like the poultry industry. You know, people who are like, oh, I I guess I have a chicken farm and I need to like compete with these people, and the people are like. You know, yeah, like I think Tyson they bid for contracts. Yeah, and then the, and then and then you know Tyson's like, oh, we'll just like buy you out, and you can be a contractor. And yeah. then as soon as they do that, then they just like put the thumbscrews on, and they're like, you have to do this many chickens and this. Da, 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 yeah, yeah. So know? so they have these like big 
business is to buy a bunch of chickens and yep. they like put out a you know contract request or whatever mm-hmm. and then you you bid on it and then if you win it you you have to guarantee them a certain number of yep. items at a certain price yep and if you fail to meet that then there's like all these penalties yep so yep. it's like yeah yeah and like uh a lot whoever of whoever traditional... has all the money has all the power well exactly as we know but and like a lot of the traditional or like small time uh, chicken farmers who like go from like their traditional model to um like say like a tyson thing yeah um they get super like depressed and angry and like frustrated because they're accustomed to doing traditional farming which involves like dignity and respect for the animals yeah and then they go into this like fucked up industrial like high production model oh yeah that's the other thing they like lease all that yeah all that yeah they have to lease it the kfo yeah 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 so it's like all kinds of fucked up shit um which I imagine, you know, Car- Cargill's fucking contractor farmy, farmer people have to do too. Yeah. Or it's like they're, you know, they're just like raping the soil. They're raping the fucking industry um, and, and transforming it into just like, you know, like an outdoor factory, you know? Yeah. And I mean, like, uh, you know, if you, if you, if we told that to a Marxist, they would say like, yeah, so they own the means of production, the the CAFO shit. Right. They lease it out to people. Right. But before that, they have all the capital, the the finance, mm-hmm. to uh, be the, the one that's buying all of the product that mm-hmm. the actual producers are producing. Right. And that's why <clears throat> they control the market, not because they own a bunch of equipment. Mm-hmm. If they owned a bunch of equipment, then all they would be able to do is like, you know, if farmers like chose to mm-hmm. convert their operations to CAFOs, mm-hmm. then they mm-hmm. could sell or lease the equipment to them. But it's the, you know, the pressure that they can put on them by having all of the money that the farmers need to get right. to be able to force them to sign these contracts mm-hmm. and to produce the, whatever number of units it is. And then they can, you know, uh, that, that high guarantee forces them to change their operations, do something other than what they would have done. Yeah. themselves yeah so it's like if we want to like put it in the terms that we've kind of used with um, money before mm-hmm. it's like they they you know yes they may own the means of production and that is significant yeah um but the more complete picture might be they own the means of um mobilizing labor yes right which may be capital as money and it might be capital as like you know they ha- they dominate the like the techno mass per se yeah. um but either way, kind of like, they're able to just initiate that kind of pressure on people. Yeah. Yeah. I almost want to come up with a different term that we can use for capital because mm-hmm. I spend too much energy just saying like capital is finance and then whoever I'm talking to is like, no, actually it's means of production. Right. Like, and I think it's... Okay. Well, you say means of production and I'll say like uh, appropriations or finance. Right. Yeah. I think... Stock. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, it, it does come down like there's a lot of quibbling to be done, obviously, yeah. and that I think the most important thing about that has always been to me what it means for praxis and strategy. Yeah. Right. Like we, you know, if we're arguing all day about what something might be in a kind of metaphysical way and we don't do anything about it, then like the whole thing has been moot either way, right? But we did have fun along the way. Right. We had fun <laughs> arguing and bickering and fighting each other along the way, right? You know, because that's what you know life is often made of. But yeah. um. <clears throat> but I think like to me the the focus should always be on like, okay, w- you know, these definitions that we use, these terms that we use, like, um, what are they good for? You yeah. know? So it's like, if we want to basically direct our punches and our screams at the means of production, uh-huh. then yeah, we might come up with like a Leninist revolution or yeah. like a Catalonian syndicalist, something or other, uh, or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Um, or, you know, or uh, something else. The um, Javan Revolution. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're back. Um, I had to let my roommate in, and I completely lost my train of thought. That's fine. Uh, so whatever, whatever uh, fucking prophecy so farmers, I was spilling. farmers no longer entrepreneurs. Yeah. Which, man, that sucks for the market. That's rough. Um, so Cargill specialized in soy products around mm-hmm. the early 2000s. Making the frogs gay. Yes, exactly. And uh, obviously, soy products have become uh, much more popular since 2000, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. probably doing pretty well. Um, yeah, I had another uh, quote here that just shows how much like marketing is involved in this bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So the article says, the problem is that many Americans and Europeans detest soy's taste. For now, that means disguising it in familiar products like cappuccino and health food bars that, though chocolate-coated, have the requisite 6.25 grams of soy per serving mm-hmm. required to make healthful cardio claims in the U.S. Cool. So okay. just because it's like it has a certain amount of one ingredient, mm-hmm. they're like, oh, yeah, it's actually good for you. It's good for you. Like, sure. What if you just ate lots more of that? I don't yeah, know. like Cheerios. Cheerios is going to prevent heart disease. Soy EOs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that I ate some cereal and soy and now I'm immortal. Yeah. I'm, I will it's never cool. die. Um, French Meadow, a Minnesota bakery, uses Cargill's soy flour to bake breads for men. Mm-hmm. Um, that may not make sense to you, but in parentheses it says... Its sterol content has been touted mm. as a natural way to prevent heart disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for women, I don't know if they make them separate. Right, se- right. Separate for him, breads. for her. Yeah. <laughs> breads. <laughs> uh, it says plant hormones limit the effects of menopause. Okay. That's cool. Well. I, so. So there's that's cool. There's a bakery yeah, that does that. Yeah, you a bunch of soy if you mm-hmm. uh, don't want to have hot flashes, I guess. Yeah. Soy flashes. For all the old ladies that are listening? Yeah. Or I mean, maybe, old, maybe, old people with who vaginas? Who knows? Maybe we Sorry. have an old, yeah, an old vagina-having population yeah. uh, in our audience. Yeah, it's we don't possible. Know I don't know. Yeah, and, uh, gracefully aging. The only people that talk to our account are like Reed and yeah. Chloe and uh yeah Soy Boy. i mean i mean we, we seem to have like what like an average of like 100 downloads per episode which yeah. is pretty encouraging yeah we're, we're like um, over 100 now yeah yeah like Dude, i'm happy I'm, about that thank you everybody by the way on on street fight brian mm-hmm. was like uh yeah if you're like a small podcast you have like like 300 listeners yeah. so they're like i'll come on there i'm like i fucking Ugh. wish we had 300 <laughs> listeners yeah 300 man. would be great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell your tell your uh, friends if you have them. Tell your friends and idiots and friends who are also idiots. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, just stealing stuff from other <laughs> from other that's, podcasts. That's how you do it. That's how you become successful. Yeah, Mergers and acquisitions, true. Ryan. Yeah. So I'm thinking of starting a stream where we watch um, episodes of Mike Huckabee's show. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Maybe do speed runs of Putt Putt Goes to the Moon. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh yeah another thing about cargill is it used to be like a really cutthroat company like uh, mm-hmm. one of those like 80s business guy companies where like you had all these like sales people doing right uh you know doing wealth creation mm-hmm. and cocaine yeah yeah exactly and, <laughs> and wealth creation so uh yeah they said in the old cargill you defended your profit and loss no matter what and if that meant blood on the street so be it mm very healthy way very to healthy. interact with other yeah. people. Yeah. Capitalism okay. is built on consent and transaction, like like voluntary yeah, transaction. Yeah, yeah, voluntary, and, all that. And peace and building everybody's welfare through, um, like, magic. Uh, but that's not blood on the that. street. Yeah. <laughs> not war. Capitalism is not about war. That was only a metaphor. <laughs> uh, President John Geisler says... Uh, it's a very strange metaphor. I'm just going to warn everyone. Yeah. This is not a camel built for collaboration. Ah, uh, yes. That old adage. That classic <laughs> thing that you build, a camel. <laughs> <laughs> for collaboration, specifically. <laughs> and uh, just just to be clear, this is not um, camel, like the query language from Microsoft. This is mm-hmm. he's talking about the animal, a camel. Yes. So. Yes. Um, so that's cool. Um, <laughs> so now we can talk about their Venezuelan business. Ah, uh, yeah. Speaking of blood on the streets. What everyone's been wondering and about. Camels. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, the whole, his, they, they actually have like a history on their mm. site of their Venezuelan business, mm. which is really weird. Uh, I guess I didn't check if they have histories of their other branches, but I just think it's strange. Shrug. Um, so th- I won't read the whole history that they put on here because that's crazy that's i mean it's a, a bunch of, of like years it's a and lot stuff. of time yeah but it's they basically like um it's basically just a history of like m&a in in uh venezuela if, oh yeah i always forget people might not know what that means m&a means mergers and acquisitions yeah it's a define your acronyms every time you businesses use businesses buying other businesses or merging with other businesses to become a new frankenstein business yes um so 1986 Cargill starts operations in Venezuela through a partnership with 
Mimesa CA, which is a that means it's a Venezuelan business, I think. I think mm-hmm. CA is their mm-hmm. like their uh, LLC, basically, mm-hmm. uh, to form Agro Industrial Mimesa in Maracaibo, Zulia State. I didn't know Venezuela had states. That's new to me. Uh, dedicated to the manufacturing of flour and pasta. I wonder if they manufacture arena, mm. the pre-cooked corn flour. Maybe they that do. we talked about on the Venezuela episode. Um, and yeah, so after they start operations, uh, every, like every single other thing basically is uh, a merger or acquisition. So 1988, uh, acquisition of Pastificio Universal in Porto La Cruz, uh, 1989, acquisition of Pillsbury, Venezuela flour mill, including a pasta facility. Uh, renowned pasta brands Milani and Suprema, and Ray Del Norte brand baking flour. Mm. Uh, 1990, Cargill negotiates all the shares of agro-industrial Mimesa, consolidating it with Pillsbury, Venezuela. In December of that same year, Cargill, Venezuela ventured into the refined oil market with the purchase of La Torre, sorry, La Torre del Oro, del Oro. <laughs> In, uh, in Termero, I don't need you guys. Don't need another place. Yeah, trill all your R's on these ones. Yeah. Oh, every single one. Uh, de Caracas. <laughs> uh, acquisition of the corporate offices in Caracas. Mm. Uh, doesn't really say the corporate offices of what. Uh, to expand into new markets, Cargill ventures into the rice business and acquires Puente de Leña Farm. Uh, 1993 purchase of Mavesa oil plants. Mm-hmm. Um, Sounds like a lot of trademarks. purchases. Yeah. Um, so they they buy a bunch of more like some more rice producing plants. Uh, oh, and uh, here's what I mentioned earlier: joint venture with with Pekivin for the construction of the most modern salt by solar <laughs> evaporation facility mm-hmm. uh, located in Zulia State. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then the rest they have uh, they create a parboiled rice plant, the first parboiled rice plant in so Venezuela. The plant is parboiled and. The rice just comes out of that? Yes, exactly. Cool. Great. Um, acquisitions of uh, Graham Oven Wheat Mills, uh, 1999, venture into the pet food business. Mm. Uh, 2001, acquisition of Agra Brands International, uh, joining efforts with Cargill Animal Nutrition to consolidate the company on the market as a major supplier of pet food. Mm-hmm. 2006, acquisition of Molinarca. Uh Oh, oh, uh, sorry. Molinarca Alfonso Rivas Wheat Mills. Um, 2010, Cargill inaugurates its Development and Inclusion Center in Granados, together with the Association for the Development of Complementary Special Education, which has an acronym, <laughs> ASODECO. Nice. Uh, in order to train people with disabilities to contri- and contribute to with their successful job placement. So they probably hmm. gave like a... Ten thousand dollar grant to this fucking place, <laughs> right? Or like right, that. just to put it on the board. Yeah, well, I guess in Venezuela it would be like a you know a three trillion boulevard grant. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Twenty fourteen. Uh, let's see. It's an interesting one. Yeah, I'm not really sure what the first part is saying. Garden located inside the facilities of the plant in order to promote. Some kind of botanical of thing. Natural xerophilic zones and protect mm. the special vegetation. I of also the... suffer from xerophilia. Yeah. I'm a xerophiliac. I don't yeah. know what this word means. I don't like xerography. <laughs> if, you, if you make me a copy on a Xerox machine, fuck out of here. <laughs> um, oh, that would be xerophobic, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. I'm really stupid. Um, so it sounds like... Oh, oh, inaugurates. Oh, I was like... I thought that said inaugurantes or something like that. So I was like, I don't, I can't parse the sentence. <clears throat> okay, so it made a, a zero fitic garden. Uh, so it means I looked it up. It means like plants that can survive with almost no water or something. Okay, so I guess like cacti and shit. So basically, I guess uh, since they got in trouble for like doing a bunch of deforestation, they opened a <laughs> uh, plant reserve. <laughs> For desert uh, plants. To make it up to everyone. <laughs> right. Um, now that we killed so everything, that, here's some good gothy plants to meditate on. Yeah, so that's basically what that is. 